So welcome everybody to this uh, sixth Eurodoc Open Science Ambassador training. My name is Gareth O'Neill and this training is to uh, support some of our national uh, representatives of early career researchers across Europe in Eurodoc. And today we have Mark Shields, President of Science Europe, talking about open access and specifically through Plan S. Uh, Eurodoc, this is a non-profit organization based in Brussels. Uh, since 2002 now. We currently have 28 national associations who are members all across Europe and they represent doctoral candidates and or postdoctoral researchers. And these organizations are exclusively uh, run for and by early career researchers. And basically we develop policies uh, in our working groups and organize events uh, to be the voice of early career researchers and make sure their needs and interests are heard. Now we've identified three main issues for early career researchers. The first one is the need to train and support early career researchers for the non-academic labor market, given the fact that most early career researchers need to leave academia. The second is uh, open science, which we'll come to in this uh, webinar and in this series of webinars. And the third issue is mental health. So we know from uh, recent surveys that a large number of early career researchers feel anxious or stressed or even show signs of clinical depression and we're trying to raise awareness for this and to practically deal with how to help researchers who are facing uh, mental health issues. Now what exactly is open science? Well this is, uh, we've been doing open science for over 400 years uh, but since 2016 the European Commission has come out with specific policy for this and this is known as the three O's. We have open science, which is basically to open up uh, research through digital tools. We have open innovation, which is to involve more stakeholders in the innovation process, create new products and new services, basically using open science. And we have open to the world, which is to open up collaboration in research and innovation in Europe, not just within Europe, but also outside of Europe and to have more societal impact. Now, open science is a broad umbrella of many practices. Most people will know open access to research publications or open data, but we also have open education, open evaluation, open licensing, open methodologies, open source, and how to involve citizens in citizen science. Now, why should we do open science? Well, this opens access to research. It increases discoverability. It increases the impact, social impact, and research impact of your own research and it helps to facilitate uh, reproducibility. And what we also see is that for institutions with limited resources or even uh, researchers with limited uh, access, it helps to give them access, they can pool uh, resources, and it helps to speed up innovation. And note that when we speak of open here, we're not talking about a black and white open versus closed. We talk about to be as open as possible and as closed as necessary where there's a whole spectrum of being open and you may open your research uh, data and results along a certain time frame. Uh, finally, Eurodoc fully supports open science and we are advocating to train researchers and support and reward them for doing open science at their institutions. And for those of you who are more interested in the different aspects of open science, you can see, uh, visit the Foster portal or visit the Open Science MOOC, which offers free online courses. Okay, so I would like now to uh, welcome and introduce uh, Mark Schiltz. Mark is the president of Science Europe. He is also the head of the Luxembourg National Research Funder, FNR. Uh, so Mark, thank you for joining us and a very warm welcome to Eurodoc and we're looking forward to hear about Plan S. Okay. This is better, well, the echo is gone, thanks. Okay, very well, well, well done, thank you. Um, Yes, well, it's a pleasure to be uh, to be with you, and um, uh, and thank you for the nice introduction. Um, uh, and um, to tell you a little bit more about Plan S, uh, Plan S is a an initiative by uh, by your well initially it was by European funders, but the European Commission started by the European Commission and by Science Europe. Science Europe is the uh, the, the organization which I'm currently chairing. Um, and which is the association of the national European funding uh, funding agencies. And in uh, September last year, September 2018, we uh, we launched Plan S, 
uh, which has as a goal to make open access to scientific papers, to scholar papers a reality uh, by 2020. And this is not the first time that funders actually uh, have taken initiatives to move forward in, on the agenda of open science and open access in particular. But it, it is somewhat of a of a of it is somewhat of an in, it is an initiative that is somewhat uh, uh, distinct from what we had previously, and I will try to to explain why why this is the case. Um, and if you if you switch the slide, maybe then. Um, so just a brief reminder. I think you you you're all in in the business of of research and science, and you have had a previous uh, previous webinars, but still. Uh, one of the reasons why, as uh, funders, we do have an interest in uh, in uh, in open science and in open access in particular, is that we uh, we we pull a lot we pull a lot of money into into research. Research is something which which is expensive, which costs money, uh, because we uh, we are trying to get the brightest talents into research so we have to pay people uh, because that's essentially it's in in, in talented people that uh, that research and science is is created for many of our scientific disciplines we also need expensive uh, infrastructure uh, be it in the experimental sciences or even in the social sciences or in the medical sciences where field studies uh, or, or, or trials have to be conducted. So all this makes um, science and research a, a rather expensive uh, undertaking. I think we're all convinced of the, uh, uh, of the benefit and of the long-term uh, impact and outcome of research. But uh, nevertheless, it's mostly, at least in, in Europe and, and in most other places, it's mostly public money that is being, uh, that is being invested in, uh, in research, in our, be it in our universities, be it in, uh, uh, in large research institutions or research centers. Um, and in, 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 our, in, in most countries, uh, that investment is being made via uh, funders or funding agencies. So we 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 are very well aware as funders uh, of the cost of, but also of, of course of the benefit of science. But we know where the money comes from. I always say the mon money comes from mostly from taxpayers. So it's public money. So we consider that the knowledge and the new knowledge that is generated through science because that's the essential goal is to generate new knowledge and to increase the corpus of uh, of existing knowledge that that is a public good because it has essentially been funded by uh, by public money now something very strange happens at the very end of this value chain if you wish because we uh, we have uh, we have these projects research projects that we fund they quite often last for 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 several years typically in my funding agency we fund projects 3 or 4 years time um, and then at the very end the outcome is is of course summarized the results of, of these projects is uh, are summarized in uh, in a publication and then so something very strange from from uh, an, uh, from someone who is looking at it from from the outside happens is that this this public good which is the norm the very end is is somehow privatized because we give essential uh, researchers give essential ownership rights over in the very at the very end uh, and ownership rights on their publication uh, and then uh, publishers take over and and they have uh, so to speak exclusive rights uh, uh, to make money uh, with um, uh, with the scientific or with the research outcome from 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 what we have funded uh, over many years sometimes uh, with with public money, so that's a state of affairs which we um, which we're not very happy with, uh, and especially since we we believe that it is a state of affairs which was justified uh, maybe thirty years ago when scientific papers was were really printed. Uh, so there were hard copy prints of journals that were uh, 
uh, that, that were produced and had to be distributed in lib to libraries all over the world. Uh, that's the situation that happened uh, the, as it was a number of years ago. But currently, with the, with the complete digitalization, it should be possible uh, the, to, to have online access immediately as soon as a paper is, uh, is published. And it should be possible to have that access uh, without any barriers or, or paywalls. So if we go to the next slide, I think to summarize the uh, maybe a little bit the situation is that you see what uh, what 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 interesting business uh, the scholar publication has become because essentially scientists give uh, give away their work for free and that work has be to that work has been funded uh, for sometimes for many years by the by the public purse uh, and then you have this important role of journals which which i think which everyone recognizes that journals do organize the peer review process um, which which is a kind of validation. So each paper that goes through the to the to the peer review process uh, receives a stamp of validation uh, at the end if it is accepted, uh, and that stamp of validation somehow tells other people or other scientists, well, this is really science. It's not pseudoscience. It's not something else. But if you look closer at it. The essential part of the peer review is also done by other scientists and is also done done for free. So we have somehow the uh, the suppliers, uh, which other scientists give their uh, give their their material away for free. Uh, publishers then have uh, service providers, which are again other scientists uh, who do the peer review for free. Uh, and then in the end, they bundle everything together and sell it back to to actually the same community, to the scientific community. Um, and that's a situation which we believe uh, is no longer uh, is no, no longer tolerable, and we should actually be in a position where uh, where science should be should be open and freely available to whoever has uh, has access to uh, uh, to the internet, and it should be available immediately without lengthy embargo periods, and it should be available for reuse. And these ideas are not very new. If we go to the next slide. Uh, that is the the Berlin Declaration. The Berlin Declaration is one of uh, one of a couple of uh, of declarations that were issued in the uh, in the early days of the millennium. So this dates back to two thousand and three, uh, which is actually I'm I'm showing this for two reasons. You you can read it, but it's it's not so much the the content that matters. But I'm showing it here for two reasons. The first reason is that this is actually the operational definition that we have used in Plan S, because there are several open access definitions. This is the one which we we think is the most uh, the most evolved one. That's is, is, for sure. This is the one that the, that we use in Plan S. It is not just about uh, being able to freely read papers. It's much more than that. It is about being able to uh, uh, to reuse content because that's in, it is about it is about being able to run technology and uh, and text and data mining tools on uh, large amounts of uh, of scientific papers. So uh, and that, that's what we want as well. We shouldn't forget that uh, there is an estimated uh, one and a half to two million papers, scientific papers that are published each year now, uh, and of course no one. Can uh, has the ability uh, uh, to to actually read or screen all these uh, all these papers, and even in your own, uh, even in my own field, it's 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 getting increasingly difficult to uh, to, to keep up to date with uh, with all the papers that are being published. So I think we should provide, give us ourselves the ability to make use of uh, of. Uh, of, uh, of modern technology, of text and data mining tools, uh, to 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 make sure, in in the sense that we still uh, that we still have indirect uh, indirect overview over all our papers. The second reason why I'm showing this up uh, is that uh, look look at the uh, look at the, the year which was 2003. That's that's more than 15 years back. So it's more than 15 years that we uh, th that we talk about open access. Um, this this Berlin Declaration was signed by uh, has to date been signed by over six hundred uh, universities and research centers uh, all over the world, but the reality is uh, that as we speak today, 
less than seventy uh, percent, less than uh, sorry, less than thirty percent of all papers, scientific papers that are published today, are actually open access uh, 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 according to this uh, to this to this definition. So we are still, after more than fifteen years, we're still a very far. Uh, we still have a lot of uh, a lot to do. We're still very far away from uh, from full and immediate open access. The next slide, I, I, there are various motivations why open access is important. I, get, I, I already gave one, which is reason number three, which is very important for us funders. We believe that, if, if that research that is publicly funded should remain in the public domain, and that means it should be open access for the, uh, for the public. Uh, but there are other reasons which are important. I think it's science lifts from the fact that uh, researchers can access each other's outputs. Uh, it is important, uh, the, the, the important role of validation and verification uh, goes via this, because uh, we generally accept outputs to qualify as scientific only if they are reproducible. And in order to check whether outputs or whether results that someone else has obtained are uh, reproducible and are therefore scientific, well, we need to have access to these results. So this whole built-in check of reproducibility uh, is actually hampered by, uh, by, uh, by closed access. If you have to pay to access other people's results, then this, this internal check and verification process of, uh, of the whole science enterprise is actually, uh, is actually hampered. But we also know that re new research builds on previously established research. And I think that's the most important, the most important aspect for, or reason for researchers. Whenever you start a new research project, the number one thing that you do is to, you do your, bibli your bibliographic research. You will try to find out and check what others have already researched and what other what others have already found uh, about the project or about the topic that you are about to investigate and if you are not able to do that because much of this research is uh, hidden behind paywalls and if you can't afford to pay for all this uh, then actually you're in a, you're in a gross disadvantage with respect to other researchers you may actually end up uh, trying to uh, to to investigate things which have already been uh, been done and where there are already results available although not openly available um, we also think that uh, science has an important role to play in uh, in society that it is important for uh, decision makers but also for users of research results like the medical profession like patient association to have access to the latest result, uh, result of, 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 of research. And finally, it's well known that the whole subscription model, so where you have to pay to access, uh, to access uh, research results has become a complete, economic, from an economic point of view, has become a completely unsustainable. Uh, library, university libraries can no longer afford to pay for all these uh, subscriptions, which, which uh, these subscriptions have been doubling uh, on average every seven years over the past uh, uh, over the past decade uh, so that has become economically uh, completely uh, unsustainable uh, because it's it's actually money which which can be which should be used uh, better and in a different way um, next slide please um, so here because uh, I, I anticipate already maybe some of the against Plan S that was in the early days when we launched it that it would restrict academic freedom but I claim that academic openness is actually part of academic of the ethos of science and uh, and part of the academic responsibility it is actually the responsibility of the scientists to make sure that research are published and they are published in such a way that they are available for the uh, uh, for the for the public and for the scientific com scientific community as a whole and i'm not the only or the first one to claim that that was already written down in 1942 by Robert K. Merton, who is one of the uh, fathers of the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the ethics and, and so sociology of science, uh, and who put down some of these principles uh, as early as 42. He even used the word open 
uh, even though at that time no one spoke of, uh, of open science. Next slide, please. You see, this is the situation. Uh, this is just an, uh, what I mentioned earlier. It's uh, uh, We are currently very far away. Uh, in green and yellow, you have the proportion of papers that, uh, that are being published open access. And in gray, you have the proportion of papers that are being that are being published uh, behind a paywall and that gives you the 75 percent uh, uh, papers that are still not not published uh, open access there is another in the next slide uh, another statistics which is worrisome uh, this is not about papers this is about journals and you what you can hear see here is that the percentage of open access journals has only slightly increased that's the yellow bit on the on the right hand has only slightly increased between 2012 and 2016 but what has happened is that the proportion of so-called hybrid journals uh, has significantly increased in fact to the point that hybrid journals that's the dark blue uh, uh, a bit in the uh, in the graphics, uh, to the extent that hybrid journals, the, uh, the the hybrid model of publishing has now become the dominant model, uh, with forty five percent. Now hybrid, we are very skeptical, and hybrid is uh, is something which we which we at least within Plan S uh, do not consider to be genuine open access uh, open access publishing for various reasons, uh, which I can elaborate a little bit further. Uh, uh, during the discussion, if, if if there is a need, hybrid also is something which which in 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 most of the time involves double payment, because a hybrid journal continues to charge subscription fees, uh, and then on top of on top of this, uh, uh, to make individual papers open access, you have to pay again another another article processing fee. So for all these reasons, uh, in autumn, uh, next slide, please. For all these reasons, in autumn. Uh, 2000 last year we published we launched plan s uh, where we simply mandate and so it's a funder mandate that uh, scientific publications reporting on results that that we have funded so we meaning those funding agencies that are part of uh, or that have subscribed to plan s that these papers or publications should become should become genuinely open access so published in compliant open access journals or on compliant open access platform. I should say that the uh, the, uh, the initiator of, of this was Robert Jan Smits, who was at that time the uh, special envoy of the European Commission for, for open access. Uh, but when we first met to discuss Plan S, I, uh, I was of course very enthusiastic about it because within Science Europe we had already it was open access was had already for some years been high on the agenda and we considered that it in in order to make this work in order to to have a real impact and to change this picture this flat picture that i showed you uh, just a minute ago uh, and uh, and and to increase significantly increase the proportion of open access paper we we had to uh, uh, to really join forces and there had to be a large alliance of uh, funding agency uh, funding agencies um, contributing to this now this is the main principle this is the main principle very simple we added uh, in the next slide we added a number of details of more details to it i don't go to read you can read it uh, we even added even further details to it which we call the implementation guidance that was published uh, that was published uh, by the end of by the end of the year um, and which is currently under revision because we launched hundred feedbacks from organizations and individuals from universities from from uh, from associations uh, learned societies uh, from publishers as well um, and we uh, we are currently uh, uh, considering all of these feedbacks and uh, under the light of the suggestions uh, we are revising the implementation uh, the implementation guidance but very briefly the the, the the what what i say the essential the essential principle in the next slide uh, i think this is uh, really what you should retain the strong principle is that first of all from from those from the research that we fund no paper reporting on this research should be uh, locked behind a paywall so we we generally want 
these papers to be open access. We also believe that open that it should be immediate. There is absolutely no use for a scientists uh, or, or for anyone except maybe for publishers to lock papers behind the paywall, say, for six or 12 months. So this embargo period, we should never have accepted this. It's very bad that, that some countries or some funders even have now translated this into, into, into law. There is absolutely no reason to accept any kind of embargo period, so that's not what we want. Uh, we want papers to be published under an open license because there's essentially, if in, in the, there are some standard licenses, and the one that we want to promote as a default is the CCBY license that embodies everything that is in the Berlin Declaration for Open Access. All, all, all this is, is within that license. Uh, we want transparency about prices, so we are ready to pay or to cover for the costs of publication, but we want to have absolute transparency we want to see what we are paying for we accept that publishers do deliver a service it's not as if we could do our goal is not to get rid of the publishers our goal is to have them change their business model uh, and and we they should no longer make us pay to access things but they should make us pay for delivering services uh, and and we are ready to pay for services but we are ready to pay uh, to pay a price that is commensurate with the services that are offered. And then I said that the hybrid model is not something that we wish to uh, to perpetuate. So we, uh, we only accept that uh, under a transitional arrangement with a clearly defined endpoint. In what sense, in the next slide, in what sense is Plan S different from from other initiatives, well, it's the first time that really a large group of funders have gathered to align their policies. We all had individual open access policies. Every funding agency had their own individual open access policy, and they were all different. They differed in the timeline, they differed in, well, the, there were those that were promoting green open access, others were promoting gold open access, and so on. And of course, this had zero impact. So what we what we do here is we, we, we align our policies. We say there is one standard policy, that is Plan S, and we all subscribe to it. Plan S entails mandating, so that's a very drastic step. We tell our grantees, you have to follow these rules. Uh, but on the other hand, we also say if, if it costs money, if there are publication fees or APCs involved in it, well, we are ready to cover for these within reasonable limits. Uh, so we, we don't want publishers now to, uh, uh, to, to, to have skyrocketing APCs. We also set a clear timeline, which is 2020. All this should start 2020. And we provide transition arrangements up until 2024. Um, but but we want to see this open access really happening because many of our of our of our policies didn't have this clear timeline and this and the Berlin Declaration didn't have a timeline either. So that's something which is new. And then a big misunderstanding plan S is about principles and it is not about a particular publication models. Many people still believe that plan S is about gold APC. Uh, uh, based um, open access funding, that's not the case. In the next slide, you can see um, that the chief librarians from Utrecht University, uh, Bianca Kramer and Jochen uh, Bosman, they, uh, they have independently analyzed uh, Plan S and they have uh, found nine different uh, compliance routes or nine different publication models that are compliant with Plan S. And these range from gold to diamond to green, uh, e even hybrid on a temporary basis. So it is one particular. We, we provide space or we provide opportunities for, for a range of publication, uh, uh, of publication models. And in fact, what we wish is that publishers trend transit to to one of these uh, one of these compliance routes in the next slide the uh, we can see that the coalition or those fund the number of founders uh, that have subscribed to planets is growing uh, and it in in fact the the very satisfying thing for us is that it has no, it's no longer a european initiative but it has become a global dimension with uh, founders from africa joining india uh, has recently joined as well 
uh, and and we are also getting a very strong interest from from China and from a number of other non-European uh, European funders because we believe we need to have a large enough coalition to really to really trigger this shift in uh, uh, in the publication system and then to to end uh, in the next slide uh, what what is very important and especially for young uh, for young researchers is that what what has to happen as well is that we need to change the reward and incentive system in science we need to get away to move away from assessing uh, people and researchers on where and in which journal they have published and to come back to return to a more reasonable way where we assess people on what they have done uh, and where we accept that there is a range of valuable output for researchers and publication scholar publication is just but one and even that one we should not measure it on uh, on the impact factor on where it has published so uh, the dora declaration many of the funders that have joined coalition s have become very much aware of this they have joined the san francisco the francisco declaration uh, we will give in the updated version of uh, of the implementation guidelines we will give this even more prominence because I think this uh, this has to this change of culture has to happen at the same time, and I'm I'm very much seeing that that the number of funders are now leading this way, so I'm very happy that we lead the way both in open access and also in uh, uh, in, in in changing the research culture and the research assessment system in science. And to finish in the in the final slide, uh, I have to say what was very unexpected is that. Uh, Plan S has also had an enormous resonance beyond the scientific community. I think we can say that this is the plan which even within the scientific community has had an, uh, an enormous resonance, but even beyond. I mean, I'm speaking now, I'm now being invited in my country and elsewhere to speak to general uh, to, to general public audiences to explain them what uh, what the problems the current problems with our scientific publication system are and what plan s is is trying to uh, uh, to achieve in that sense and i'll stop it here because i'm have already slightly overstretched it and i will be very happy to uh, to to answer any of your questions thank you so thanks mark for that I'm just going to switch back here and I see quite a few questions have come in uh, already. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to uh, jump to the first, uh, the first question straight away. So why after 15 years since the Berlin Declaration and over 600 institutes university having signed a declaration is only around 30% of scientific articles open access? What do you really think is the number one uh, impediment to this? Well, it's difficult for me to 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 classify a number one impediment, but there are a number of uh, uh, there are a number of reasons. Well, one reason is that um, uh, those who pay are not those who use, uh, or put, let me put it the other way around. Scientists need access to papers, um, but they rarely have been aware of what the costs involved with this are because what those who pay are usually the university libraries or, or national consortia they negotiate with the publishers and they they pay in the end the bill and the scientist never knows as has no idea what 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 it costs uh, so i think this separation uh, because you, the user and the payers in most other areas of economic activity, the user is the payer. Uh, but here it's not the case. And, and that has, of course, been used in subscription rates. Because it's, it, in, and, and then in, in a university, it's usually not the librarians who, who are very powerful and influential. Uh, it's usually more the scientists, and that's how it should be. So librarians had the scientists on their back telling them we have to have access to all these papers. Uh, and then they went on the table, these librarians went on the table to negotiate with publishers. Uh, so, so that's one of the reasons, but there are others. Uh, the, the one of, the one, one, another reason is of course that, uh, that, that, that some publishers 
have been very smart coming uh, coming up with other new tricks like the hybrid model. I think the hybrid model is a very smart trick to uh, to, to 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 pretend. Uh, to be that we that 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 it is a way to to achieve open access, uh, and at the same time uh, having more income because you have the subscription income and the uh, and the open access income. Um, so it's difficult to single out one uh, one particular reason, um, and and then another reason is which we have mentioned is this also this. Um, uh, uh, what I call a little bit this fetishism to for to publish in the top journals, and I think there that there are business models of journals which are extremely selective, uh, and of course these journals are then being used as a proxy to measure quality, uh, uh, and and we're all guilty of this. We've all heard uh, uh, in 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 committees, well, he has uh, candidate X has published in Nature. Candidate Y has two papers in in science, uh, and we should we should we should come back. I think to uh, and this has been this has been used by publishers in in a smart way to create these highly selective journals, which uh, which are very expensive now, uh, but but in a sense it's a very poor proxy for quality, and we should become aware of that. Uh, I've just gone back to what you said about uh, researchers not always being aware. We, we've we talked to many early career researchers and we see that they're not always fully aware of the costs involved, especially when we're talking about secret deals with the libraries, but also uh, when APCs need to be paid in some models like in the Netherlands, it's organized through the institution. So it very, it very often the researchers themselves don't even see the actual costs um, involved. So a question to you is, how have many uh, researchers reacted so far to Plan S? And I know there's been lots of discussion online, but how would you summarize the reaction so far? Well, it's, um, let me say, it's, 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 it's difficult to get an overall view. I, I, I also see that it is very discipline dependent. Uh, so I was last week uh, giving a presentation or in a debate at the Europe at the European uh, uh, Geoscience Union, uh, and I sensed that this was a community uh, who are very much in favour of open access, who seem already to have quite a large number of uh, of journals of their journals seem to be already open access. So it was. Um, uh, it wasn't actually a very, it was not so controversial, at least not with the public, maybe with some of, or at least with, with people on, on, on the on the panel. Uh, then other, uh, but but it's different for other, for other disciplines. So I think it's very discipline dependent. Uh, I, I, I think there are some, there have been some very vocal opponents uh, but um, and and even in the debates that I attend, there are usually some very vocal opponents. But when I then uh, make proceed to a final vote, in the end, uh, including the silent uh, majority, then then we get quite often a much more balanced view. Um, I think scientists are concerned that they may no longer be able to publish in their preferred journals, which is a uh, uh, which is a which is a sensible concern. But but again, our goal is not to primarily our goal is not to forbid uh, this or that. Our goal is to uh, really incentivize publishers and journals to change their model. Uh, and, and I think scientists should be with us on board. And I'm happy also to see that a that that what is happening now more and more is that editorial boards from subscription journals that they they resign and then they create a new version of the journal which is open access. I think that's. That's, I think that's how it should be. I think scientists, the research community, should take the control of the publication business uh, back back into their, into, into their hands. And one of the questions here is, what, uh, what do you think are the biggest myths around Plan S? Uh, well, the biggest myths which we are constantly debunking is that it should just be about uh, gold uh, APC open access. 
And I think we never said that there is. In, if you if you read the uh, the Plan S paper, there is no meant because that was when I when I discussed it with with Robert Jan. That that was one of the uh, when we discussed the, the Plan S. It was one of the issues we were always very clear about. We should not go into debates about green or gold or whatever or bronze or copper or whatever exists because i i've been following the open access debate for quite some years and uh, and, and 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 there was there is a very sterile and futile discussion or or, or, or con contradiction between there are the, the the gold adapts and the green adapts uh, and 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 we didn't want to get into this so that's why we say it should be about principles our main principle is that the paper should be open access and it should be open access with the appropriate license uh, and whether the route that is to achieve that open access whether it's green or gold or whether it's diamond or whatever is is something that that we shouldn't uh, that we shouldn't uh, uh, we shouldn't promote one or the other but of course there are models which are not compliant I mean, the pure subscription model is you cannot make it open access. So that's uh, that business model we don't want. The hybrid, for various reasons that I've given, uh, are not uh, are not uh, is not com is, is is not compliant either. So the the greatest myth was about that is about um, uh, it's just a goal a plan for gold open access. Um, there are other myths. Uh, there is the myth that uh, uh, that a plan as will trigger a uh, uh, lowering of the quality because th th there is this strange association that open access is necessarily lower quality and that it, it, it will open it will open uh, the road to predatory journals which which to which i answer well the predatory journals existed before you have low quality journals that are open access and you have low quality journals that are subscription just as you have high quality journals that are open access and you have high quality journals that are subscription. So there is no correlation between quality and openness. Uh, but still, that is quite often again being brought up. Uh, the predatory journal, just, just a word to that. Uh, I, I absolutely believe in the self-control of the scientific community. Would you as a scientist want to publish in a predatory journal? I, that's the question number one I ask. Would you want to publish your see your name, your paper in a predatory journal? I wouldn't. Most I, I haven't heard yet anyone who says yes. They all everyone says no because uh, I will immediately be recognized by my peers uh, for having published in a in a predatory journal. So I think this will all in, in it will always remain marginal. I think we all aim, or at least I, I'm convinced that 95% of researchers aim for quality. They they do want to publish their papers in quality uh, in quality venues uh, and not in, in in predatory journals. So so I think that's that's a wrong argument in my way. It's certainly not a good argument again against Plan S. Yet it is one that is being brought up uh, quite from time to time uh, over and again. Huh? And uh, there's a good few questions here, so I'll try and get through them. We have um, would fund this comes to th this question relates to how uh, perhaps APCs would be paid, whether it would be through a grant or not through a grant. So would funders cover the cost beyond the grant, or would that be covered by the researchers who use the grant? So I guess what that means is would the payments of let's say APCs through Plan S go through their actual research grant from the funder, or would that be somehow separate? Uh, I Well, that's, I, I think that's up to the individual funders to decide. Uh, I, we, we in, in, in my organization, we have sub, set up a separate fund for covering uh, open access fees. And I know a number of other funders have done that as well. Yeah, I think in the Netherlands, they have such... Uh, um, we, we have set up a separate fund because we, we recognize that, um, that the papers, the publications usually come somewhat later, somewhat uh, at, at the time when, when often the project itself is already finished. So we want to, uh, we want to close the, uh, the payment for the project after a three-year period 
uh, but we realized that that papers will only come later. So that's why we have set up a separate uh, a separate fund. But but that again, it's it's up to individual funders to uh, to see which kind of arrangement they do. I would also say that the uh, uh, most importantly, um, what, what what is now we we are working close very closely with the OA twenty twenty initiative. The OA twenty twenty initiative is an initiative. Uh, 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 mostly led by the by the Max Planck uh, Society, uh, to 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 flip or to which which promotes the, the so-called transformative agreements, and the transformative agreements they consist in in using the budget that libraries uh, have up to now been spending on subscriptions, to use that same money and use it in the future. For, uh, uh, for 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 publishing fees, so in that sense, it will it it will be cost neutral. I mean, those countries and and there are now the first of such a transformative agreement has been signed in Germany with uh, uh, with Wiley. So where, where where really the the same amount of money that 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 flew into a subscription fees is now being used for uh, uh, for 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 publication fee, and I think that's essentially that's the way to go to move forward. Is to to really transform, use the same budget, but but repurpose it uh, instead of using it for subscription, use it for uh, for publication fees. Um, we have a question to the uh, the title of uh, open full and immediate open access by twenty twenty. Uh, is it possible to implement all these principles by twenty twenty? Well, I will be very open uh, here. It is one of the questions that we are that we are currently considering because we got in our, uh, as I say, we are uh, we are revising uh, uh, um, the the implementation guidelines, and of course, in these six hundred more than six hundred feedbacks, there are from from all sides there are this question is being raised. So we'll see uh, we'll see what we can implement by two thousand and twenty. And what may take a little bit more time. So that's something which I can, at this point, not yet give you an, uh, a complete answer. Sure, a number of these principles uh, should be implemented by 2020, but then maybe others uh, need a little, bit, a little bit more time. Uh, so that's something we'll um, we, we'll know more about in 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 a few weeks' time when we when we have find an agreement within the. Um, Within the coalition, uh, on 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 what's the sensible way to go? But in any way, I mean, we don't want to. It's it's out of question for us that uh, that we still wait for another ten years in order to get this done. Uh, so I think these these times are over. Uh, so there may be for certain of the things that will be implemented, there may be a little bit, a little a short a short delay, a little bit more time, uh, but. Uh, but I don't want to wait for another 10 or 15 years. I think that's that's definitely not what we are going to. And do you expect uh, the coalition to keep growing over the next year, for instance? Yes, that's what I expect. I think we, we are still in discussion with, uh, uh, with other funders. Uh, uh, I, th I think a number of funders are waiting to see what the updated implementation guideline will, will look like. Um, and then uh, I'm very much confident that the coalition will grow. I'm also very much confident that the uh, uh, that the drive, because the drive towards transformative agreements, uh, that 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 this will also uh, help um, help Plan S and open access in in general to uh, to become a reality. We we now seeing more and more of this cancellations of big deals so we have the university of california we have still germany that that haven't come to terms uh, with the largest publishing house uh, i i think there will be a multiplication of these cancellations and of the of the uh, of the from and university library to uh, uh, to go for transformative agreements uh, which which are fully in line with plan s and if that happens i think we're on the then 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 uh, and i i can feel that this is about to happen right now and then we're on the uh, then 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 we're on the on 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 the road where we can no longer 
as escape that, that that the open access will become a reality. And how how have the uh, the let's say the large publishers reacted to Plan S? You know, and when I say large publishers, maybe I should split them. How have the commercial publishers reacted, and how have the society uh, non-profit publishers reacted? Well, I, 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 the, the, from the large commercial ones, we have a, uh, we have a variety of reactions. We have from some of them have little interest to enter into dialogue, and others are interested in uh, uh, to have an, and, and we maintain a, uh, we maintain a dialogue with uh, with a number of them. But of course, our condition is the plan S. So we uh, we will we are very we are ready to discuss with publishers on on ways to to implement and to to achieve plan S compliance. But we're not ready to discuss on the principles uh, themselves. When it comes to uh, society publishers, I think we also have to be careful here because um, there is a great variety when it comes to society publishers. There are some very large learned societies, uh, which uh, which I won't name, but which uh, in my view are almost behaving and are being run in the same way as uh, as commercial publishers. They just have this status of, uh, of non-profit. There are also many small and medium-sized learned societies uh, who only publish maybe a, a, a dozen or half a dozen of, of, of different journals. Now, with them, we are pursuing an active dialogue as well because we recognize their particular difficulties. difficulties. We recognize that these smaller and mid-sized learned societies usually do not have uh, the same facility to enter into these transformative negotiations, uh, agreement negotiations, uh, as to have some of the larger publishers. So we are trying to figure out with them together so that the uh, Welcome Trust and UKRI, together with the Society of uh, Learned and Professional Pub Society Publishers, have uh, uh, have commissioned um, uh, some work to to find out how learned small and medium-sized learned societies actually can flip uh, their business models uh, uh, in in a, in, a, in a not too risky way uh, under under plan s so i think it's very important we don't want these societies to become to become the victims of uh, of plan s and just to check we're talking mostly about uh, research articles papers what's the position of plan s on monographs or books Yes, that so these these are for the moment not included in Plan S uh, for for the very reason that we uh, that it needs a different we feel it needs a different approach uh, and we uh, we have a working group uh, within Science Europe that has already addressed some of the aspects of uh, open access in uh, in monographs uh, we we will address this as well but at a later stage because it needs a more uh, there is a variety in, in, in books and monographs. There are great dis, uh, differences between fields. Uh, so it needs a more careful approach. Uh, but we will address it, but at a later stage, and we also understand uh, that this is probably, we have to be, um, we, we cannot, uh, so the, the deadline of 2020 cannot be applied, uh, cannot be applied to these. So this needs much more discussion and interaction. There are especially two communities which are concerned. It's the, it's the humanities, which, uh, which still have a, a strong tradition of publishing in, in books and monographies, and also the uh, research in, in, in law, at least in continental Europe. Much of this is done in uh, via monographies. Uh, so we have to have a more, uh, a more intensive discussion with these communities and also with the publishers because these are different a different community of publishers so, so we will address it but not uh, but at a later stage and uh, we we see that apcs have been increasing and you know when you link it to impact factor some apcs article processing charges are quite high do you see uh, as we shift from let's say paying to read to paying to publish do you see the costs of APCs going up? How can this be limited? Well, 
the, the, the one way to limit it is to, to, have, uh, to have transparency. So we want to see well, what, is, what is the APC composed of. What is it? Uh, the, if we pay an APC of, of 2,000 uh, euros, say, what, 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 what's, what are we paying actually? So we want to see a breakdown of the costs and of the price. What, what, does, it, what does it imply? Uh, and, and, and the second principle that we wish to implement is, uh, is, is, is about uh, commensurability. So well, whatever we pay should be commensurate with the services that are being delivered. So if a publisher comes and tells us uh, our APC is 30,000 euros, well, then I want to know what services do I get. And there are other publishers who only charge 2,000 euros. So if you tell me that your APC is 30,000 euros, you have to tell me what services are you delivering that are 10 times more worse more than, than, than that of other publishers. That's how I see it. So I don't want... I, I, I want to see APCs co transparent, commensurate with services delivered, uh, and, and certainly not, not uh, proportional to the impact factor, because that's not a service that is being delivered. Certainly not proportional to the, uh, to the selectivity. I mean, if, if, the, if there is a journal that rejects 95% of, uh, of, uh, of submitted manuscripts, that's their choice. It's not, uh, they, they, but that doesn't in itself justify that they, uh, that they should, should charge 30,000 euros APC. It's their choice, because I don't believe that the 95% of the papers of the manuscripts that they, that, that they, that they reject, that this, is, that this is poor science. I mean, of course, Papers should reject papers that are poor, but uh, these highly selective journals they have to uh, they have to justify why why they are rejecting ninety five percent of the papers, and certainly not the reason to uh, uh, to to have uh, astronomic uh, APCs. Uh, now the other thing we're still what is still under discussion is the cap. Uh, that's something that we have to whether we will install a cap or not, and uh, and in what form. That needs some careful thinking as well, because uh, it, it it may actually have negative uh, or, or unintended effects as well. If we uh, set a cap, it may have the consequences that those journals which have APCs that are below the cap may actually be incentivized to uh, to raise their APCs. So these are things that we have not yet decided and that we are we're still considering with uh, with great care. Okay, and just coming coming towards the end. Um... I know that the uh, there has been many uh, comments given towards the implementation of Plan S. I believe you had something like 600 comments, so 250 uh, organizational comments and 350 individual yeah. comments, and you're processing them now. What yeah. can uh, researchers do, particularly early career researchers do, to you know get more aware of Plan S, but maybe also to get involved in uh, helping this transition towards open access so that it works for everybody? Well, I must say that uh, in my experience, uh, the uh, early career researchers and, the, and uh, shall I say, the younger generation of established researchers are actually much more, much better informed than uh, uh, sometimes than the more established uh, uh, generation of uh, of researchers. I also find that the, uh, the younger generation of researchers are much more open towards open science and open access. Uh, open access in general. So uh, I, I I think what I, I should say, even if I don't believe that Plan S will fail, but even in, if even if it would fail, it, it there, there is one lasting legacy of Plan S. It has triggered an enormous debate. There have been in, in countless debates and, and, and panel discussions and, and, and on the social media. It was just incredible what happened. So I think that alone was worth it. I think we'll get much more than just, than just a debate. But that alone was worth it. And I would encourage um, uh, early career researchers and, and organizations like yours 
to continue that debate, to continue the general debate about open science, but also to reflect on the uh, on the reward and incentive system of uh, of science. I can see in, in in my university it's quite open the younger scientists that are very much engaged in open science, and I want in the future I want it as as funders, but also universities that we reward this, that we appreciate this. Uh, so I think keep the discussion alive uh, and, and contribute to it. So I, I think it's it's very critical what you said about the reward system that uh, institutions need to start working towards how to move away from impact factor and rewarding publications in you know impact factor journals in both career progression and research evaluation. Um, but I think something else that's crucial here and you you've kind of you've kind of referred to it is the fact that senior researchers in many cases also to an extent determine where early career researchers will publish or their publishing behavior so how do you think to, to wrap up on this question uh, how do you think early career researchers can engage senior researchers or their supervisors even and try to get them to come on board towards open access and be more open to it because in many cases they can even uh, stop such behavior Yes, but on the other hand, there is uh, there is data about this as well. Uh, there is data about the fact that uh, papers that are open access are actually uh, more cited, actually more quoted, actually more read. And in the end, that's what we want. We want the papers to be read. Uh, and, and, and there is a good case to make for open access here. Uh, we, if, if, if the only purpose of a paper is to have it somewhere on your, to, 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 to list it on your CV, well, yes, then it's irrelevant where you publish, whether it's open access or not. But if you want your papers to be read, if you want your papers to be uh, to be noticed, to be uh, to be to be downloaded, then then uh, there is a clear case to make for open access. I don't know whether this answers the question entirely, but at least it's part of it. It's definitely part of it. So, uh, you know, Eurodoc has, together with the Marie Curie Alumni Association and the Young Academy of, Eurodoc, uh, Young Academy of Europe, uh, supported the principles of Plan S. So maybe what I can say is in future, we're looking forward to talking with Science Europe and Coalition S and how we can help shape open access to work for early career researchers. Um, I'm going to knock it on the head here and say thank you, Mark, for answering the questions uh, to our ambassadors. Uh, I'm going to say thanks to everybody listening in. And uh, we look forward to the next, the last few webinars dealing with open licensing uh, and the European Open Science Cloud and some open science policies. So thank you to everybody for listening in. And thank you again, Mark. Well, thank you for, uh, for giving me the opportunity. It was a pleasure. Thank you.